Thank you, Mary Kay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have to say, I used to look forward to those calls when someone would say, Mary Kay Shields is on the phone, because it would mean two things. One, something really important was happening in Michigan, um, and she was uh, kind enough to reach out and get someone else's thoughts. And uh, two, as you can tell, she's always a trip to talk to. <laughs> Kathy, uh, members of CMU's faculty and administration, um, I'm grateful for all you do, uh, putting a few kids through higher education now as we speak. Um, I am, uh, my renewed faith and respect for those of you who work in higher education grows every day, particularly as you have to put up with uh, my kids and others like them. So as they come home and we talk about what they learn in their experiences, it reminds me that uh, we maybe we should be talking K-20 uh, as opposed to just K-12. And Governor Michelle, thank you. Truly an honor to be here with you all. And to be part of just really what's a groundbreaking event, the dedication of the Central Michigan University Center for Charter Schools, named after uh, our Governor John Angler, whose leadership is just well known uh, through here and throughout the nation. Um, he's a man of integrity, a concept which, as I remind my children every day, means that you do what's right even when no one's watching. Um, coming off the plane yesterday with him, I was reminded how well regarded he is across the state. I mean, within a few steps, there were well wishers and hellos and thanks um, just as he was coming off with me and going out to the car. And I've seen this at events around the region. He's considered a regular guy with exceptional insights and talents who has demonstrated leadership in lawmaking, education reform, and business. But of all of his contributions, his signature accomplishment was transforming the way Michigan does business in education. You know, it wasn't an easy time back in 1993 when he was attempting to shake up the status quo. Back then, we did not know what we didn't know about education failure. The data was not as prevalent, and while we could see the failure from Flint to Detroit, the more successful school districts would soon learn that they were masking the failure among groups and subgroups, hiding behind the educational success of the more educated and advantaged families in this nation, in this state. Angler and the incredibly dynamic team he assembled knew this, however. They saw the reading scores. They saw the graduation rates. They heard from parents all over the state about the decline of the educational system, many of you in this room who were there at the beginning. The costs had gone up, the quality gone down, and they were resolved to do something about it. As Jim Gunner writes for Education Next uh, in this, uh, this summer's edition, John Engler was naturally attracted to charter schools. He had seen for too long how districts treated their students as property. He saw the chartering strategy as a politically viable means for gaining leverage of school districts and others he felt that were not serious about improving education. It wasn't going to be easy. As a national clearinghouse for what works in education when we started, CER provided ideas and counsel to many of our friends on the ground here. We transferred lessons learned from one state to another, and we helped build public awareness of the debate here as it unfolded, because you really truly were leaders among a handful of states. Looking back on what was said and done reveals a story of amazing accomplishment seemingly against all odds. So I've put together a brief timeline taken from our written observations over the years in our flagship monthly letter to friends that I thought I'd share with you that tells the evolution quite clearly. November 1993, these are direct quotes from what we wrote. This is a newsletter that's gone around the country for years, first in print and later in email to about 50,000 people. The proposals currently in front of the people in Michigan provide an opportunity to further discussion of school choice. This is November 1993. And the education of the people in Michigan and nationwide Governor Angler's plan is expected to be considered by the end of the month, and in fact, later that month, we and colleagues here on the ground through a town hall, Lawrence Patrick and Amato were there in Detroit, and people were fle coming off the streets from an ad they'd seen in the Detroit Free Press to actually voice support for something that sounded really radical at the time to a lot of people in November 1993. December 1993, the Michigan Assembly passes legislation authorizing charter schools. School districts, community colleges, and universities given the authority to grant and to develop charter schools. There are a number of amendments, we caution, that can be made to broaden the scope of the program, but barring a victory even short of that, the program is still a welcome addition to the charter school legislation in other states. It increases the level of awareness here and the public at large across the country. June 1994, in Michigan, the Michigan Education Association has told several universities, yours was among them, that it will not accept their student teachers if these universities authorize charter school without the union's approval. 
Saginaw State University, among others, was also told that the MEA would tell alums to stop donating to their alma mater and would further tell its professional staff to stop participating in training programs and professional development. October 1994, dismissed from the courts two suits alleging that charter schools in both Michigan and Colorado violate the Equal Protection Clause. By November 1994, barely an year after the ink was dry on charters, a Michigan circuit court struck judge struck down the state's charter school law, arguing the charter schools are not really public schools and cannot therefore be funded. To remedy this, the state's obviously appealing and legislative leaders plan to push through a bill in the lame duck session that would make these schools permissible. In the meantime, charter schools are on shaky grounds and an interested business community, Jim Barrett was among them, there is working how best to help them. Whatever, has, whatever happens has great significance for us across the country, we said. December 1994, the legislature meets to rework the law so as to make charters permissible under the state's constitution. The Senate has approved two bills, one to provide stopgap funding to the eight approved public school academies, and one that brings the charter school law into compliance with the court's ruling. It's problematic whether or not this type will fix, will allow the schools to remain independent. Sounds ominous. February 1995, the Michigan Education Association has committed to spend $8 million for three years for a PR blitz. Members, members are angry that have been, their dues have been hiked $30 to finance this campaign, which is targeted to reviving MEA's marginal political influence in the capital and poor public image. Sorry, that's what we were saying. MEA racked up political losses this past year in gubernatorial, Senate, and school finance battles. May 1995. At least 50 new charter schools will be approved this fall under its two-year-old law. A majority of the 39 schools approved by Central Michigan University alone will be up and running this coming school year. Among the CMU schools is an inner-city Detroit charter run by some of the city's African-American leaders using the Edison Project's challenging curriculum. Earlier this year, Michigan voters overwhelmingly told the Detroit Free Press that the, charter schools are not, that the city's schools are not challenging enough. More than half of those living in major urban areas expressed their support in that poll for school choice. July 1995, the Great Lakes State discussion is brewing about lifting the charter school cap totally, which currently sits at 60, 75, expanding public school choice to allow students to attend any school in the state, like Minear, Minnesota's pioneering program, and giving all public schools freedom from curriculum, certification, and tenure rules. 1995. We're just talking about tenure now in the country. It's really remarkable. We've been talking about it too long. Schools could become independent operating entities by a vote of their board. November 1995, the midterm report is out in the bipartisan National Education Goals Panel, now headed by Michigan Governor John Engler, says the nation is far short of where it should be. While there are indications that math and science achievement is improving, most other indications show that learning remains stagnant or failing in areas such as reading. Sound familiar? January 1996, the school superintendent in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Jeffrey Grotsky, is refusing to provide transportation to students attending a charter school in his district. Excel Charter School has even offered to pay for the bus service, which has 180 students and specializes in teaching the core subjects with an emphasis on character development. But Grotsky says no. Quote, if a charter school wants to open, God bless them but I will not help them get into business or stay in business. These are just some of the battles that you and people across the country have had to contend with. April 1997, Detroit fans report that Superintendent David Sneed is seeking the approval of the school board for 10 charter schools, and Mount Clements, home to elementary and middle schools run by Edison, plans to be the home of the first Edison High School. September 1997, Michigan charters benefited from a state Supreme Court ruling that said, unequivocally, charter schools are public schools and publicly accountable. That was a great day. 1997, teachers at the Mid-Michigan Academy in Lansing, Michigan, a charter school, rejected the state's first attempt at charter unionization. We believe that we and the administration walk together to keep the interest of children first, said Christy Morin, a first grade teacher there. Charter schools are built on principles of teamwork and innovation. Strength come, comes from working together to offer children a better education. Amen. January 1998, the AFT filed a Freedom of Information Act requesting the names and home addresses of every teacher in a Michigan charter school. February 1998, you guys are really in our newsletters a lot. Wow. 
Michigan Governor John Engler suggested the state's intervention, Doug, you'll appreciate this, might turn around Detroit, where the percentage of children who graduate in four years is only 29%. Hasn't really gone up by much, has it? But cries of local control dominated, and Detroit remains on its own. Just imagine if back in 1998, Engler had gotten his way, how many lives would have been saved back then. At CER's fifth anniversary in Washington, 1998, Chris Whittle, a major national player on the scene here and elsewhere who actually helped pioneer the private investment and interest in education, says, in Michigan, look what happened when a governor embraced the very ideals that education is all about, choice, accountability, and excellence. He said and told the audience, when Governor John Engler's first term began in January 1991, despite the pressure of a $1.8 billion deficit, and a history of $400 million executive order budget cuts, John Engler increased education spending by $350 million in the first two years. Proposal A, approved by a landslide vote of the people in 1994, solved the problem of high property taxes and inequitable school funding by cutting property taxes more than 80% and creating a portable foundation grant for each and every child in Michigan. This is something that people around the country still don't understand. At the time, there were people from the right of Governor Engler saying, is he crazy? I thought he was a local control guy. I thought he was a Republican. And yet, what's he doing to our funding base? And yet, what he and Doug Roberts did with school finance at that time was brilliant. It took the sting out of moving money and prepared the state to recognize and operate in an environment of choice and accountability. Because when money follows kids, accountability follows adults. In 1999, and it's still something that's so difficult to get through in any state. 1999, bankers started coming and supporting charter schools. They told Park National Bank loaned about $12 million to Michigan charter schools, Citizens Bank processed several bridge loans in the funding. Back in January 2012, the MEA once again boasts it had a role to play in defeating the state's cap lift for charter schools. February 2000, Governor Engler said he will push another cap lift and he'll pair it with an increase in school funding, getting in touch with the people who represent things on both sides. In April 2000, the ultimate ripple effect when the Inkster School District voted to actually hire a private management firm to come over and take care of its schools. June 2000, supporters hold a rally to lift the cap on charter schools again that had left charter school growth at a virtual standstill. Universities, the state's primary alternative sponsors, have to keep all the applications they have on hold with the time numbered around 100. In January 2001, Governor Angler calls in his State of the State address for the legislature to lift the cap on university sponsors. Charters sounds like a passing parade. It sounds like a repetitive years and years of effort. And yet, even as the reports continued over the years and numerous attempts were made and failed by people in this room and elsewhere, it failed to be truly understood in the legislature until recently. The enormity of a system that has no shortage of challenges and a public that recognizes the importance of change but is not schooled in how to get it. There was a mixed bag for years of policy and political players who impeded the development and the growth of better schools for kids because their livelihoods were based on adult interests. And it discouraged the progress and consequently put roadblocks in the way of tens of thousands of students who could have benefited from this reform in those 10 and 12 years. But nearly 12 years later, Governor Rick Schneider and the leadership of the Michigan State House succeeded in lifting the cap that acted as a do not disturb sign for several years to countless Michigan families and educators trying to get in the door. It happened because Governor Schneider lived up to his commitments. It happened because Senator Pavlov, Speaker Bolger, Representative McMillan, Lyons, former Representative Scott demonstrated sound leadership. It happened because of the excellent track record the Michigan authorizers have had in ensuring the schools that they authorize are held to high standards and the expert advocacy of the council that represents they and their colleagues across the state was never absent from this debate. It happened because the leadership of the schools locally and their association, Dan Quisenberry among them, it happened because the school leaders represented that good enough was no longer good enough. 
It happened because Michigan, now has an A grade in the national rankings and a fifth place showing for its much improved charter school law, recognized it could no longer tolerate mediocre education that protect adults at the expense of kids. And it happened, frankly, at the heart of it because Governor John Engler ensured that before he left office, there was the right infrastructure in place to guide and lead the effort to bring about more of these innovative public school choices over time. You know, the mark of a great leader is that he surrounds himself with great people who improve the work at hand every day that goes by and that measure their success not by praise and popularity, but by the numbers and impact. Look at the leadership of the John Engler Center for Charter Schools. It sounds good, doesn't it? Past and present, whose people are still working to advance the cause of charter schools. You've met Mary Kay, Jim Gunner, and others have been leaders in the state since the movement's inception and have gained national prominence for their diligence. Dick Postumit, Jim Barrett, and others like them fought reform before it was cool. Jim McClellan and Len, Len Wolf could have found fancier and less hostile lines of law to defend, but they chose to be part of the policy landscape that Engler established. Dozens more whose names are known and lesser known stand behind a movement which fought Goliath and won over and over again so that education's future would be assured for the people of this great state. And still to this day, the governor remains committed to an agenda in the nation's most influential business organization. The thing is, you have to understand something. This isn't normal. None of what's happening here is typical. Sure, there are great pockets of reform success plastered on the front pages of the newspapers and news programs. By the count of our media bullpen and house, it's about a thousand of those news articles every day cover the kind of programs and efforts going on in states like this around the country. But it wasn't always like this. It took years to get to this level of media attention. And because it was once almost exclusively negative, most politicians were loath to challenge the status quo. Doing so caused allegations of profiteering, right-wing and anti-public education sentiment. Never mind the nation's first few charter school laws, oh, and by the way, vouchers, were bipartisan, multiracial success stories. But the papers and the pundits used to get their perceptions almost solely from the education unions and the education establishment. The words choice and accountability were fighting words, and few who entered public service or life were prone to putting their political lives on the line. Unlike when your state began reforming its delivery system, its funding standards and accountability, most recent success stories have found favor in the press, in the legislatures and among a growing number of groups. Louisiana's Jen Dahl, Indiana's Daniels, Colorado's Higginlooper, and others have cover from Democrats for Education Reform, the Black Alliance for Educational Options. There were none of those when your laws were created. No Students for Education Reform, no Students First. There was no Stand, there was no 50 Can, no Achieve, no National Charter Alliance. There was only the Alphabet Soup of Education Groups, the Mackinac Center, of course, and CER at the national level. So understand that the landscape was dramatically different and more difficult and less support was available to those who dared to challenge the status quo than anyone has experienced in the last several years. Mao Zedong once said, imperialism and all reactionaries are paper tigers. John Engler saw that the unions were a paper tiger and the system as the imperialists, dictating what should occur without regard to need or effect. He was committed and shrewd, and no matter how many setbacks were had, he kept rethinking the strategy with regard, without regard to need or, or effort and turned to his people to lead the way. Years have passed, and the governor's gone on to other conquests. He now leads the most successful and critical business entities at the Business Roundtable, and to no surprise, education remains at the top of his list. When he came to D.C. to take on the helm of the National Association of Manufacturers, I actually fought his gatekeepers to talk to him to invite him to contribute to Mandate for Change, a blueprint we were putting together for the incoming administration to shed light on how the federal government can best support the work of the states. What better author I reasoned than an accomplished governor who clearly understood the role of state versus federal government? Governor Engler wrote in our Mandate for Change on transparency. Manufacturers live and die by the credo, to measure is to improve. The same should be true with education. The lack of good, timely data remains a fundamental weakness of K-12 education in the U.S., and it hampers our ability to reform, to improve, and to demand accountability. 
I truly believe that somewhere in America we've solved every single problem we have in public education, except for the organization of the system as a whole. We simply need to recognize those achievements and transfer them to other states, districts, and schools. And he's absolutely right. So it's fitting that at a place where excellence thrives and when transparency through accountability is evident, be named after the state's esteemed Governor Engler. The Center for Charter Schools here didn't need a federal or state mandate to figure out that performance data can result in improved academic achievement and that by measuring how well we do, we can ensure we do well. The data systems that CMU are, have are now state of the art and they're transforming how children in this state and elsewhere are educated. This isn't happening many other places. We look at these information systems all over the country. There are very few that actually can even mirror the amazing performance metrics and data systems that allow CMU's Center for Charter Schools to see real-time data about how the teachers, kids, and schools are doing in every area that they authorize. It's truly astounding, and it's a story, as I've shared with friends here last night and before, that hasn't been told that needs to be told. Among Michigan's highest performing charters, most people don't recognize that CMU dominates. The center's scorecard demonstrates superior performance, robust academic growth, and, and especially among all socioeconomic groups and children of color. The nation needs more alpha authorizers, as the National Charter School Institute's Gunner puts it. Love that term, Jim. They are courageous, independent, yet publicly accountable entities that have the tenacity to serve as change agents, market makers, and forces for quality. This is a model that we transport day after day to state lawmakers that we are working with that just have no idea how this could possibly work and yet you are sitting on truly in the, and so fitting in the middle of a nation on some of the most amazing innovations in public education that anyone could have ever imagined 20 years ago seeing. Governor Engler pioneered this movement for student-centered funding and transparency for results. Today's dedication event is much more than charter schools than it really is about the need to meet the urgency for performance-based accountability throughout the state. Your commitment to that idea, Governor Engler, paved the way for one of the most successful university-based authorizers in the nation to bloom, and it resulted not only in an environment rich in choice and accountability, but the replication of the strong charter school laws modeled here in Michigan around the country. It's fitting your name will be on the center, a gold standard of university authorizers for charter schools around the country. Congratulations, Governor. Congratulations to the leadership of CMU and the state for having the foresight and the leadership to do what's right, regardless of who's watching. Thank you.